I've got your bio and all that, so I don't have to worry about those kinds of details. So let's just start with a really broad thing. As I understand it, uh, in this coming year, the Just the Beginning Foundation is going to hold its annual meeting here, and, that, and that's a trigger for a lot of this. Let's begin with, what is Just the Beginning Foundation? Just the Beginning Foundation is a, is a multiracial uh, group that celebrates the history of African Americans in the federal judiciary, that retains and gathers some of that history, and then uses that information to educate the public, and specifically very interested in reaching children and high school students and college students and law students to ultimately encourage more students of color to go to law school. Um, and so we have scholarships for law students. We have an educational program called JTBF in the Schools that is started in the Chicago Public Schools for 10th graders, teaching them about the 14th Amendment and Thurgood Marshall and the whole civil rights movement and using African American judges as role models for the children. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have these conferences which help generate the material and then we use that material to create lesson plans and to fulfill that mission. And the other part of the mission is I wouldn't be here but for the work of the Nate Joneses of the world and the Thurgood Marshalls of the world and the Constance Baker Motleys of the world. And so another huge part of it is to, is to pay tribute to them and to carry on their work because they've been such tremendous role models to us. In addition, it's not just an African American story. These are untold stories. And we think that these judges are role models for all Americans, not just African Americans, because their impact on the law has affected all Americans. It's, it's that sort of basic point that, as a historian, is close to me that people want to talk about, oh, African American history as if it's some sort of, oh, that's the extra chapter or something, rather than seeing it at the core of the story, and it really is at the core of the story. Well, it is at the core of the story, because you look at what Thurgood Marshall did. William Henry Hasty, Constance Motley. I mean, they were the engineers of the civil rights movement and those rights have impacted everybody. Women, uh, any kind of disadvantaged group has benefited from the battles that they fought for. You know, people, especially younger people who you're trying to reach, uh, we all know, those of us who have been high school teachers especially, that we all know they have very short memories. So, oh, African Americans on the bench, no big deal, because it's in their lifetime there have been African American members of the of the judiciary. <laughs> but when you look at American history, there have been African American attorneys that go back to the mid nineteenth century. But how long did it take to have any African American on the federal bench? Well, the first appointment, a presidential appointment, was Irving Mollison. And he was appointed to what is now known as the U.S. Court of International Trade. But it had very limited jurisdiction. But the major first appointment came in 1949 with William Henry Hastie. He was the first African American appointed to the Court of Appeals. And then in 1961, James Benton Parsons was the first African American appointed to the United States District Court. And remember, the federal judiciary was created in 1789. There have been more than 2,800 people appointed by presidents to these lifetime positions. And of that number, 100, approximately 145 have been African American. And so we went for, well, from 1789 to really 1950 before we had our first African American. And then there was a dearth of appointments after the James Benton Parsons appointment. Most of the appointments really occurred in the 70s, in the late 70s when uh, Judge Jones was appointed. And actually it was President Jimmy Carter who coined the phrase, just the beginning, because he was the first president who appointed women and people of color in large numbers to the bench. And so that's a quote when someone asked him about his appointments, he said, well, it's just a beginning. And that's how we um, came up with that name 
and we started it in honor of Judge James Ben Parsons because he was celebrating his 31 years on the bench and he was retiring. And so we coined that phrase. And we really started it as a one-time, one-weekend event. It really started as one night, one dinner. And he was very modest, and he didn't want a dinner in his honor, but he said he would agree to a celebration of the integration of the federal bench. And the weekend was so successful, and we learned so much, and it meant so much to the Chicago area and national community because we did it in partnership with the Federal Bar Association, which is what we do when we do these conferences every other year. We go to cities, we partner with the legal community, with the business community, and the um, broader community to bring these conferences. And it was successful, and so we formed the foundation, and that's how we started. Why Cincinnati 2006? <laughs> well, Cincinnati 2006, in large measure because of Judge, former Judge Nathaniel Jones, who is a trailblazer and a lion in his own right, and because of the work that he's done as a judge and the work that he's done off the bench and the work that he's done with the Underground Railroad, it was fitting, we thought, that it should be in Cincinnati. And then his co-chair, uh, Judge Jeff Hopkins, uh, has shown extraordinary leadership. And they were both willing to make the kind of commitment that we need when we go into other cities. Will this have, and the fact that the foundation will have its meeting here, and you talked about its goals with students and partnering with community groups, will the fact that the meeting is going to be in Cincinnati, will it have some impact in Cincinnati that people will be able to observe? Well, we hope it will have impact. It certainly had impact in other cities. One way it has impact, direct impact, is that we, um, one of the uh, conditions of us agreeing to come to any city is that scholarships be awarded to law students from that local area and so we will have scholarships for the students. Also one of the um, key components of the conference is public educational programming. So we will have panels that the public can attend uh, in addition to the large dinner banquet that we have. And I am told, of course, I'm not in those cities, and so I can't give you any scientific data on it, but the feedback we get from the judges and the various bar associations is that it has made a difference. Because part of what we do, I mentioned the different um, publics that we deal with, the African-American community, the legal community, the um, business community, the opportunity to work together and to come together for the goals of this conference, I think, helps forge relationships that might not have existed before and certainly shows off the kind of talent that we have in the African-American community. And I certainly think that's very helpful to the community. And I hope it has a long-term impact in terms of inspiring students. Plus, we hope this year, when we have the conference in September, we will kick off the Just the Beginning in the Schools project with a pilot school here in Cincinnati. Is that going to be in cooperation with Knowledge Works? Uh, that I don't know. Yeah, you're, you're also uh, yeah, in Knowledge Works. Yeah, directly. Okay. Uh, what's the exact date? What are the exact dates of the conference? Uh, September 21st to 24th. Okay. Um, a couple of uh, slightly different types of questions. The, the decision to come here, there's a lot of Cincinnati. Greater Cincinnati, who are very concerned about how the rest of the country sees us, particularly around the issue of race relations. One, was that a factor in making this decision? Two, um, what, you know, you don't live here. What is, what are, what is your perspective about Cincinnati around this area? Um, I have not studied the Cincinnati area. I mean, I know that there were some issues here. Um, I know that a lot is being done to try to heal some of those wounds. I think that we are a non-political entity, a not-for-profit entity, so we don't get involved in the politics of it. Uh, but our board felt that 
it's centrally located. We have the Underground Railroad Museum. And because we were bringing what we think is positive energy and positive role models that we could um, help further healing in this community. Uh, again, not in a political sense, but just to uh, show how blacks and whites and people of Asian Pacific origin and all the other groups can work together toward a common goal. Because part of what we do is not just collect data on African American judges. We have those same charts on uh, Asian Pacific judges, on Hispanic judges. Uh, we've started doing the bios of those judges because we feel that it's very important for each community to know its history. And then you're strengthened by your own history. And once you have that history, then to me that makes you a better player in the larger community because you have that confidence that sustains you within your own group. And I'm a big believer in building bridges to the larger community. And I like to think that what I've tried to do as a judge not just in the courtroom, but in terms of my other activities sort of reflect that. So not just being chair of just the beginning foundation, there was a point where I was president of the Federal Judges Association with a membership now of about 900 federal district and appellate court judges. So what I try to do is show that you can, I'm not trying to be all things to all people, but that you can have a very strong role in the African-American community and have a strong role in the larger community and that those don't conflict, so. Um, one question that's not directly related to the convention and the, uh, the annual meeting and the, and the organization itself. And it's um, every other year. Every other year, mm -hmm. okay. Um, the, the way the public usually gets focused on I can even say the way a newsroom usually gets focused on federal judges is sometimes around the decisions, but frequently it's around what we've been seeing <coughs> in the past few months, which the appointments uh, questions about uh, who the president is going to nominate and who the Senate is going to, what they're going to do with that. How would you suggest that the ordinary person ordinary American citizen look at that process, examine that process, and think about what's going on there, because we're not legal experts. How, how, how should we even be thinking about these nominations? Well, um, certainly there's a lot of information now in the media about prospective candidates to the bench. So I guess I would say first, it's helpful if you read information about those candidates. Um, because it's a political process, uh, at least when you start at the district court level, uh, most people are recommended, or most judges at the district court level are recommended by senators in their states. So certainly if you're talking about what impact can citizens have on judicial appointments, I think the impact they can have in the first instance is through the political process because the, the senators make the recommendation to the president. And uh, then most nominees have to be reviewed or evaluated by various bar associations, usually local bar associations in their area. And once you receive ratings, usually a superior or an outstanding rating, then the president uh, looks at prospective nominees. The American Bar Association evaluates those nominees. And then if the president nominates you, you go through the hearing. And, and So the, in, in terms of keeping up with things, you know, Congress has, or the Senate, the Senate Judiciary Committee actually has a web page. I'm not so much interested in gathering <coughs> information, data, but for the ordinary per person, let me, let me put it this way. How should we, what are the values that are important for a judge, and to what extent is race important? Since you know you're representing the, you know we're we're here talking about the just beginning foundation. To what extent is it important that race even be a factor as as we talk about this? Well, I, what I think is important is that I think 
that those people who come into court and whose issues are tried have an expectation that at least some of the people on the bench will reflect them and reflect their background. We, all federal judges, take an oath to do equal justice to the rich and poor, uh, to the big and small, to those of all colors. And we have to apply the law and provide equal justice to all. So race is not a deciding factor in cases. I mean, we, just like any other judge that's appointed, has to look at the law, has to look at the precedent, and make those decisions. Obviously, you're a product of your environment. And so having judges that are reflective of the people whose issues they decide, I think, can be helpful. So that's why I think there was great interest when women were appointed to the bench, when Hispanics were appointed to the bench, um, so that the, certainly the perception by the public is that everyone is getting a fair shake. And that's not to say that you couldn't get a fair shake with a judge who was not a judge of color. Okay. That's what I thought you'd say. I just wanted to get it out. Um, did you have, when you were, long before you, um, although you, you were appointed a judge, a federal judge, when you were 35 years old, which I found somewhat amazing. Um, just, whoa. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what's my reaction to that? But the, maybe when you were in law school, did you have a hero? Did you have a judge who you, and maybe it wasn't a federal judge, did you have somebody who you looked to and you thought about who was a role model for you? Well, Thurgood Marshall was a role model for me and Constance Baker Motley, and then closer to home, Damon Keith, because I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. So I had read about his decisions and certainly studied Thurgood Marshall and uh, lived in Detroit during the riots, uh, was just a young child during Brown versus Board of Education, but was very fortunate that my parents were fortunate enough to both have college degrees. And so we spent a lot of time around the kitchen table talking about the victories of the Civil Rights Movement and Thurgood Marshall and Constance Motley. So those were my role models along with Damon Keese, but I never knew them. I didn't personally have any relationship. There were no lawyers in my family. I think most people would know who Thurgood Marshall is and have some sense of who Thurgood Marshall is, but Constance Motley may not be somebody who is a household word. Who was she? She, I read about her in Ebony Magazine, one of the great giants in the publishing world. Uh, John Johnson passed, you know, within this last two months, so we've lost a lot of giants, and in the last four weeks, Constance Motley passed as well. And she was the first African-American woman to sit on the district court in the country. She was appointed, I want to say, around 1966 or 1967. Um, she was an extraordinary woman. Um, and uh, her family could not afford for her to go to college. And she was. Um, uh, a businessman in the community saw what she had done with an organization as a young woman after she graduated from high school, was so impressed with her, decided that he would pay for her college education and her law school education. And she then worked at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund with Thurgood Marshall. She argued 10 cases before the Supreme Court. She won nine of them, really 10, because 20 years later, Batson was decided that dealt with discriminatory juries. So she would say that she won all 10 of her cases before the Supreme Court. She was the first woman and first African-American Manhattan borough president, which is incredible. So she was just an extraordinary, an extraordinary woman. And just think about her with Thurgood Marshall and Bob Carter and all the men. And she was just as effective and just as strong. And she represented Martin Luther King. She represented Medgar Evers. I mean, she was right there in the battle. And she had such great dignity and a wonderful, booming speaking voice. Plus, she had a family. And she was very feminine. 
She liked to dress. She was a great role model for women because she was the total package. So she was uh, the person that I really related to. That was great. That was great. Um, uh, thank you very much. This is <coughs> more here than I can ever use. But thank oh, you very okay. much for being here. All right. Okay. Um, stay there. What I'd like to do is move. I was talking to him this morning about doing this interview. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, he's from Knoxville. So I said, oh, John. Quiz question, you know, who was the first African-American judge on Ballard to get, to get to the hasty question? Mm -hmm. yes. And then he didn't know it. I said, oh, That's so right. He is, he's from Knoxville. He's from Knoxville. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, Judge Jones, a uh, couple of things here. This, this meeting is coming, and uh, partly because of, of your involvement with the city. You're no longer on the bench. You're now retired. Does that give you a certain freedom? You know, judges, when they're on the bench, they have, they have to be very careful about what they say, especially with news people around. Uh, does this give you a certain freedom? Oh, absolutely. I, I've uh, said on many occasions that I feel as though I have reclaimed my First Amendment rights. I can speak uh, more freely. I can uh, advocate. And I can express my views on controversial issues, uh, which I could not do while sitting as a judge. So I do have a, a greater sense of freedom. A second area, because you and I have talked about this, I know that as, as a person, but as a judge as well, it's been very important for you to be a mentor and to cultivate younger people um, who you have worked for you, uh, who clerk for you, but you've gotten to know. Um, I, I know some of those people have become judges. What's the relationship for someone who has been a pioneer, a lion, as Judge Williams called you, to, is that something, is that a part of your career that you look back on with some real pride? Oh, oh very definitely. Um, I, I've always felt uh, during my uh, period as a judge that my law clerks uh, uh, were like family. We were very close, and I took great pride in the, uh, in the progress that they made when they left uh, my chambers and went out to do uh, whatever it was that they wanted to do. And uh, they've all uh, uh, achieved, and they've, they've made their marks, and it's been a source of great pride, just as you would feel about your own son or daughter uh, who has uh, gone out and succeeded. So I do feel that way, and I, I maintain relationships with all of my uh, former clerks. And how many former clerks do you have on the bench now? Uh, there are six who are now judges, and there's, uh, <coughs> there's another young man who uh, was just uh, nominated for city council in Charlotte uh, at large election, and I'm very proud of him. I think he'll be elected. So uh, they have, uh, they've just moved about the country and are doing, doing great things. Uh, I was just notified yesterday that one of my clerks has just been appointed administrative law judge uh, up in Cleveland, so I, I have to give her a call. Uh, I missed her call when she uh, sent me the message. But you get these reports, and, and it's a source of just enormous pride. Thank you very much for both of you being here on Newsmakers this morning. Thank it's you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I hear the door rumble.